Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanella Morales, and I'm a project manager at Emble EBI. Thank you for joining us to learn about a new initiative between the NCBI and Emble EBI. To start off the webinar, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kim Pruitt, who is the Acting Chief of the Information Engineering Branch at the NCBI, and Dr. Ewan Burney, who is a Director of Emble EBI. Together, they will share some welcoming remarks. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining our joint webinar. To begin, I'd like to give you a little bit of a historical perspective of the long history of collaboration and coordination between NCBI and um, EMBL EBI, which I'm going to shorten for as EBI. Um, NCBI and EBI have been uh, working very closely together for a, a very long time, starting with um, the, our partnership as members of the INSDC, where, where we exchange uh, nucleotide data on a nightly basis. Over the course of the um, 2000s, as genome annotation, genome assembly, and sequencing really geared up, we began working closely together on aspects of annotation and curation, um, methods and metrics to uh, provide annotation, methods and metrics to have our annotation be consistent time over time. And this uh, resulted in a collaboration called the Consensus CDS Project, or CCDS, where we, we set ourselves the goal of providing a stability for protein coding annotations uh, between the RefSeq and, and GenCode annotation data sets. That collaboration uh, was, was very successful. We shared methods with each other. We, we shared quality control criteria with each other. And we shared curation re results with each other and really formed a close partnership. Um, the CCDS project helped stabilize the, and, and harmonize the protein coding gene annotation of, of the human and mouse genomes, um, which uh, of course benefited uh, public users of those resources um, across the world. We're really excited to um, bring to you today our, our new initiative, which is targeting transcripts. And so we are basically expanding on the principles of our, our successful CCDS collaboration to target providing a consistent identical transcript data set where we will be targeting, um, you know, creating a data set where RefSeq and Ensemble uh, slash GenCode transcript models um, are identical and are tracked and a, a, an identical transcript data set will be put forward. So um, Ewan, I'd like to pass the opening remarks to you at this point in time. Great, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I'm Ewan Burney, Director of Emble EBI, and let me just add my welcome here. Um, as Kim said, there has been, I think, a critical role uh, in the, between the collaboration of Emble EBI and NCBI for human genomics and other areas of biology, um, and as well as the CCDS project, our relationship also in the Human Genome Reference Consortium means that we have slowly built up uh, a consistent international view of these key human resources. Like Kim, I'm just really excited that we've got to the stage of uh, talking about transcripts from the very first base pair of the five prime end to the very last base pair of the three prime end. And uh, that, for the people who know this area, will know that is actually more complicated and more detailed than you might expect. Um, so, uh, welcome to this webinar, but perhaps far more importantly, um, uh, I'm just uh, welcome to watching this project, I think, start and mature over 2019, and um, uh, it's great to see these two teams uh, at EBI and NCBI working together. Thank you, Ewan and Kim, for the introduction. I'm going to take about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, to talk about the aims and the goals of the main project. I wanted to, uh, to start by first highlighting who is behind this effort. This is a joint collaboration between the EBI and the NCBI. Essentially, the two groups have been doing transcript annotations since the Human Genome Project was initiated. This is led by Terence Murphy on the RefSeq side and uh, who is speaking next, and myself and Adam Frankish at the EBI. But this slide just demonstrates the large number of experienced annotators who are working on this project 
behind the scenes and I wanted to acknowledge them and the funders. As I mentioned, we've been doing annotation for decades now and actually we really think that having two independent transcript annotation methods in parallel has been hugely beneficial for the entire scientific community. And I think we have a much higher quality set of annotation as a result. Um, we are, as, as Kim mentioned, we've had the CCDF collaboration for many years, and I think there's healthy competition and sharing of ideas going on both in, in parallel at the same time. Here are some key, key differences between the RefSeq set and the Ensemble GenCode set. So the RefSeq set is often characterized by this NM identifier, which is for the manually annotated transcripts in the, that set. The XMs have been automatically produced and the transcripts don't necessarily match the reference genome. This is a key difference between the two sets. It enables the RefSeq set to represent a prevalent or more standard allele, which is not necessarily the one that's in the reference uh, genome assembly. But it also that means that it can be independent of the reference genome assembly such that is protected from changes to the reference genome. And as we've had many different versions of the genome over time, this has enabled the RefSeq set to be more stable from a sequence perspective. And maybe this is why, in my observation, th this set is used more for clinical annotation uh, or a subset of NMs have been used more for clinical annotation historically over time. The ensemble gen code set, however, characterized by these rather long identifiers with lots of zeros in the middle, very characteristic. On average, we have more transcripts per gene because we have m m done manual review of more transcripts. But the transcripts must match the reference genome. So they have, with each new genome assembly release, we've, re we've changed the sequence if necessary. On average now, they're very, very stable because the reference sequence doesn't change much. This is an advantage if you're doing next generation sequencing or a genome-based analysis because your variant calling and your transcript annotation will be in sync. And maybe for this reason, this set is often used as the reference set for large-scale projects um, such as DTEX, 100,000 Genomes Project, the Human Cell Atlas, um, ICGC, and many more. But it is also the default set on the Nomad and Exact browsers and on the Cypher um, clinical browser. So there are, there are two main transcript sets, but there are also many transcripts per locus. Um, this is TSC2, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and in Ensemble, we have annotated 69 transcripts. We only build transcripts where we have evidence, so this does reflect what is going on biologically, even though sometimes it would be nice to think there was only one transcript that was relevant. As the, our sequencing costs and capabilities and accuracies continue, the technology continues to improve. So this trend will only get, we'll only, get, we'll only see more transcripts as we assay more and more different tissues and we have better sequencing technologies. So this, this increase in transcripts per locus is set to continue. All of these transcripts doesn't, however, make it tricky sometimes for practical reasons. Um, and although biology is best done by looking at all alternative transcripts for a gene, sometimes we observe that scientists, browsers, tools do in fact choose one default. It does help if you're doing a genome-wide analysis, doing all transcripts like from all loci against all can be sometimes not practical. And some browsers need a default or have been designed to have a default for display purposes. So who does this? Well, in fact, Ensemble actually has a secret canonical transcript. We do not promote it on the Ensemble browser. However, it is there in the API, and this was because we needed it in order to build our orthology pipeline, um, comparing genes in different species. Nomad has adopted Ensemble's secret canonical transcript. Um, also, Cultimate has a subset of transcripts. Uniprot has a different method for defining their canonical isoform, as do RefSeq. So you can see that in practice, there are different defaults, but they're not at all coordinated. And in fact, this does have an impact. 
at best, it's a waste of time. At worst, it really can lead to misinterpretation if people don't understand that these differences exist. And this is just looking at SCN5A. This is a real example from a real distressed user, um, a gene associated with cardiac disease. The default isoform on NOMAD and ensemble is actually the fetal isoform. But if you look in Uniprot, um, then the default is the uh, adult isoform. And of course, Klimvar has a mix of different NM-based transcripts. And so this person, even though they thought they knew the gene fairly well, um, it took them an hour to really figure out what was going when they were trying to do their analysis. So these, this is causing waste of time and confusion across the community. So we set ourselves the challenge. Can Ensemble and GenCode, uh, Ensemble GenCode and RESTI work together to choose a default transcript to improve this uncoordinated um, system that we have now. Because we believe that it would be better to have a standardized default across all browsers. It can provide a useful starting point for comparative or evolutionary genomics. With caution, it can be used to help improve standardizing clinical reporting. But I really want to emphasize that We've done this work, but we still believe that it's important to consider all transcripts whenever doing any kind of analysis. So how should we define this default transcript? We started by consulting the scientific community. So earlier this year, we ran a transcript survey. We had nearly 800 people reply. And um, so I've just chosen three questions to get you to think about some of the issues. They're based, they're very simplified examples, but they are based on real genes. And I thought it would give you a chance to have a think about some of the issues. So question one, um, I'll read the question. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Um, and then I'll reveal what the survey came up with the answer. So for a gene without known clinically relevant variants, which transcript should be the default transcript? So here the choice is simple between transcript A and B. A has low overall abundance, a slightly longer open reading frame or coding region, and transcript B has high overall abundance. I'll give you a couple of seconds and then I'll reveal what our survey said. Okay, so in our survey, um, we had different types of users and, but two main groups were those that were working in the clinical or diagnostic, re, clinical diagnostics or clinical research. So we bundled all of their replies into one group, which I'm going to call the clinical community. And then the other people who came from more university or commercial or nonprofit sector, I'm going to bundle their results into a group that I'll call non-clinical. And I'll do this for the three questions. So if we look at the results from the survey, those that worked in the clinical setting slightly favored the, the longest uh, coding sequence, whereas those that worked in the non-clinical setting um, had quite a strong preference for the most abundant transcript sequence. So there was a difference there. Moving on to question two, for a gene with clinically relevant variants, and these are the red marks at the bottom of the slide, which transcript should be the single default transcript? So here we gave a choice of transcript C, which has the longest um, CDS, transcript D, which covers slightly more um, clinical variants. These both have overall medium abundance, or transcript E, which has high abundance. I'll give you a few seconds again, and then I'll reveal the answers from our survey. Okay, so the survey dividing the results again into the non-clinical group and those that worked in clinical diagnostics or clinical research. Um, there was little support for the, the transcript that just had the longest uh, coding region. Transcript D, which had the greatest coverage of the clinical variants, was quite strongly favored by those working in a clinical setting. Transcript E, which was the one that was most abundant, was most high, it was slightly favored by the non-clinical setting. And we actually in the survey also gave an option of choosing a historical transcript, but that wasn't favored by either group. 
Final question then, for a gene with clinically relevant variants, which transcript should be the single default transcript? So transcript F, which has high overall abundance, but low in the clinically relevant tissue, or transcript G, which has very low overall abundance, but much higher in the clinically relevant tissue. Now again, five seconds, and then I'll reveal our answer. So the, the survey, again, we also gave a historical transcript option that wasn't favored. But here again, you can see that there was quite an even split in the clinical community between the one that was more abundant overall and the one that was more abundant in the clinical tissue. But in the non-clinical community, there was a much higher preference towards, towards the one in um, high, highly expressed in the clinical tissue. So the take home messages from the survey, and I hope that you also had this experience in going through the questions yourself, is that there was no clear consensus on one best way to define a default transcript. And this, unfortunately, this meant that there is no easy, perfect solution that works for any type of science. There was a clear mandate in the majority of people who replied to the survey who did want best and ensemble to work more closely together. And on this basis, we decided to proceed and to create uh, the matched annotation from NCBI and EBI, the main project, because we thought it would be better to have a coordinated default transcript and to work together to get this be standardized across all browsers and resources. So the main project then, we, we're selecting a transcript set that has the following attributes. The transcript must map DRC H38 sequence to facilitate next generation sequencing. We want one transcript per locus. Initially, this is what we're going to call the main select. And our goal for this year has been to do this for 50% of genes. And we're pleased to announce that actually we've achieved this 53% of genes. And Terence Murphy will talk more in detail next about our progress, our methodology, and our plans. And so the next year we will aim more genome wide. The transcripts must have 100% identity between RefSeq and Ensemble, i.e. the sequence must and the boundaries must match from UTR to UTR, including the CDS. This is an extension of Kim mentioned in the introduction of the CCDS project. Um, but here we are looking at having the coding sequence match perfectly, as well as the UTRs. Of course, we try and choose the most well-supported transcripts, the ones that have got good uh, expression, that are very well conserved, that we think are good representatives of biology at each of the loci. We expect these transcripts to be very stable, but we would consider updates if there was good new data that is uncovered and um, important to, and it's, we, we deem that it's important to refine the, the transcript choice. We do take into account uh, specific clinical data where we have this, um, as we've been doing this manually, but we are looking at methods of trying to automate this more. So as I said, in the, in the rest of the webinar, we're going to go into the methodology, and if you stay for part two, we'll go into that in more detail. But our future directions are that we, we continue to do this. Um, we expect to be able to do it for up to 90% of genes, and in parallel, we're working on main plus. The main select is to choose one transcript per locus, but we really believe that it's important to look at more than one transcript. And so we're looking at main, the main plus, which is an evolution of the LRG project. Um, Joe and Ella will talk more about the LRG project in the second webinar later today. The main plus would be a transcript set that's well supported for so several transcripts, if necessary, per locus taking into, cap, into consideration tissue specific or relevant transcripts that are relevant to specific user groups. This should be the highest value transcripts. We make sure that we represent all exons and that they're well supported. The LRG project, which has been a collaboration for many years now between the NCBI and the EBI, will continue as a manual effort to review um, 
transcripts for the main plus set, but also we will make LRDs where there is a good reason to have a sequence that does not match the reference genome. Good candidates for this are the ABO gene, which is still unfortunately broken on the primary reference assembly, the Huntington's gene, which has a different number of repeats that's been used and published on historically. Um, and these are good cases for making LRDs. Terence is going to talk more about different display options and we will work with the different browsers and resources. We already have talked to UCSC, of course, the Cosmic and Nomad about this project and the EBI and the NCBI will obviously um, have these transcripts on their display browsers. This is just one mock-up of one way we might um, think about doing it ensemble. So we would highlight very clearly the main select transcripts and then we would have an expanded set of main plus transcripts and then the rest of the transcripts we will continue to annotate wherever we see evidence um, of transcription. In conclusion therefore the EBI and the NCBI are working jointly to produce an annotation set of transcripts that match perfectly. There'll be one default per locus called the main select. These transcripts will match GRCH38 including the rest speak, so there will be some changes to the coding sequence where there have been mismatches in the past, and there will be many changes to the UTRs. We aim to have this as a default transcript across all browsers, and just as a very clear take-home message, we are not saying that this is the only transcript you should look at. Please look at the others as well. Um, and here's a contact address if you please give us feedback, and we will you links to the data, parents will give us give you links to the data so you can download it yourself and test it in his presentation. And with that, I hand over to Terence Murphy. Thank you, Fiona. So I'm Terence Murphy. I head the NCBI um, RefSpeak team. And today I'm going to tell you about um, a bit about the methodology we're using for the main project and the progress that we've made so far. We can break methodology down into four parts. First, I'm going to tell you about how we pick a select transcript from the set of transcripts, both in RefSeq and Ensemble. I'm going to tell you a bit about how we precisely match ins between the RefSeq and Ensemble set, how we can learn from these analyses and improve both the RefSeq and Ensemble data sets. And finally, a bit about some of the precise um, issues that come up with precise sequence and um, how that's going to impact uh, users and different resources. So how do we choose a select transcript? Let's consider a typical protein coding gene. So in the RefSeq data set and the Ensemble data set, we have roughly similar annotations with a variety of coding and some non-coding transcripts for this single locus. Many of these transcripts are fairly similar between the two data sets, and some are unique, for example, in RefSeq versus Ensemble. So from all of these transcripts, how do you go about selecting a transcript that is representative of this locus? To start, both groups have developed independent pipelines to analyze the set of transcripts for each gene and choose a select transcript. The approaches we're using are conceptually similar, but with distinct implementations. We're evaluating criteria like conservation and expression, representation in different data sets, and using length typically as a fallback choice. To give you a sense of how this works, I'm going to walk you through one example. GPX4 is a glutathione peroxidase. Mutations in GPX4 are associated with a rare lethal dysplasia known as SMDF. The annotation in RefSeq has three curated protein coding transcripts, and the ensemble gen code annotation is fairly similar. There are two regions of major alternative splicing. The five prime end, there's two distinct promoters, resulting in distinct five prime exons and distinct five prime coding regions. And in the three prime region, there's an alternative splice site that changes the reading frame compared to the other two transcripts resulting in a distinct and longer three prime coding region. So what's a good choice for the select transcript? Should we pick the longest, which would be this bottom transcript, at least the longest protein? Should we pick the oldest, which would be the middle? 
or use some other criteria. If we look at expression, we can see some clear differences between these transcripts. These middle tracks are showing you pileups of either uh, conventional transcripts or RNA-seq reads that reflect the abundance of the different exons. This third track specifically represents counts of RNA-seq reads that span the junction between two exons. So we can use this as a precise measure of how often the splice event is seen. What we can see here is this exon is substantially more abundant than this one, with a difference in expression of 5 to 30-fold, depending on the data set you're looking at. The alternate splice in the 3' prime region is even more pronounced. You can't even see the alternate splice showing up in these graphs. A higher-resolution view that I'm not showing here shows us about a 100-fold difference. So together, this is favoring the middle transcript here as being the most abundant. We can also look at conservation, which is similarly informative. Here we're using a data set called PhiloCSF, developed by Mike Lynn, Manolis Kellis, and colleagues at MIT. PhiloCSF uses alignments between genomes computed by UCSC for sets of mammals or vertebrates to determine if a region appears to be under selective pressure that you would expect for a coding sequence. It's based on an analysis of codon substitution frequencies, or CSF, which essentially looks at rates of synonymous versus non-synonymous sequence changes to estimate if a sequence is more likely to be protein coding. It's frame-specific, which is why you see three separate tracks here, and positive blue signal is indicating conserved sequence. So for GPX4, we see positive signal for these seven exons corresponding again to the middle transcript. In contrast, the alternate five prime coding region here and the, the coding region for, um, for the top transcript with the alternate three prime CDS doesn't show conservation. The alternate splice in the three prime region also disrupts uh, the peroxidase state domain and would be expected to result in a non functional protein. And the upstream exon here contains a sequence necessary for mitochondrial localization, which may be important. So all of this taken together, we get a consistent view that favors the middle transcript as being perhaps the most functionally relevant and the one that we would pick for the select set. It also happens to encode the shortest of the three proteins. We've developed code to compute on this type of data across the entire data set. And here I'm comparing the correlation between conservation and expression and what in the RESTIC pipeline, uh, we've chosen as the select pick. And what you see is there's a very high correlation, about 0.9, between expression and conservation. And for the RESTIC select pipeline, when the two are, are don't lining up, we bias towards conservation over expression. In the ensemble pipeline, it's using similar metrics, but with different implementation. So for looking at conservation, they're using a data set called a PRE, which looks at domain structure and conservation through protein alignments. And for expression, they're comparing data sets to long transcripts as a proxy for um, how abundant uh, transcript might be. So despite the two um, fairly distinct implementations, we see a very high correlation between what's chosen between the two pipelines. They pick the same transcript splice form 70% of the time. That also happens to match the protein that's represented as the Swiss pro canonical protein isoform for this 70% of coding genes. For another 24% of genes, the two pipelines pick the same CDS, but deferring in the 5' prime UTR. And there's a small subset of about 6% of cases that are deferring in the CDS or have more complicated situations going on. So to close this gap, we can review, we can iterate and refine our automated criteria, and we can also turn to manual review of complex cases and high priority cases to make sure we're making good picks. So next, 
how do we precisely match ends between the two data sets? As Ewan alluded to, this turns out to be more complicated than you might think. The precise five prime ends in RESTSeq and Ensemble are often similar, but slightly different. RESTSeq typically represents a single long end for a set of alternative transcripts, whereas Ensemble may represent a set of different ends. Neither one of these data models really represents the typical ends seen in the cell. Biologically, transcription typically starts in a region that may be quite precise, say a range of five or 10 bases, or a broader region like this one, where transcription mostly starts in a few somewhat precise locations, but overall is, is somewhat diffuse. So typically there isn't a single one answer at the base level. But we need to pick a single base and we need to agree, agree on it between the two data sets. So to address this, we've turned to the Phantom 5 CAGE dataset produced by the Riken Institute. CAGE stands for Cap Analysis of Gene Expression. This is a deep sequencing technique that specifically captures the five prime ends of transcripts based on a post-transcriptional modification of the five prime ends. It can be used to precisely measure the abundance of exact five prime ends seen in a sample. And Riken's run this analysis in around 1,800 samples, so it's a very diverse data set. It's also useful to look at tissue specificity. For this example, the data can be represented in a graph form like this, where the height of the graph represents how many times this particular transcript was seen. The max peak here is nearly 10,000 individual transcripts starting at this exact base and another 5,000 at this particular base and so on and so forth. What we see, there are four tight clusters of transcription starts in a region that's spanning about 100 bases. So from this, we still need to pick a single specific start site. So we've reprocessed the data to find what we call the longest strong site. The goal here is not to use necessarily the absolute peak, but to pick a frequently used site that's representative of the overall data. From this data set, we're able to connect cage peaks to 83% of select transcripts and pick a precise base, leaving about 17% where we need to look for more data or finding additional rules. The cage peak is typically shorter than the existing five prime end in both RESTSeq and Ensemble. But in some cases, cage indicates transcription is commonly starting from an upstream site and we need to extend the transcript. For the three prime ends, there are two considerations. Transcripts can often have multiple three prime ends that may differ by sometimes many kilobases. In this example, most transcripts end here, represented by some of these annotations. But, but there are rare transcripts extending to here, here, and here that you can barely see in the graph, and even an additional one out here that's disappearing. These long extensions may be rare and they can be tissue specific, but they can also represent significant biology, including microRNA targets. They may be required for short RNA expression. So both RESTSeq and Ensemble GenCode have historically preferred to represent a maximal three prime UTR, extending all the way out to here, even if it's rare, and we're both continuing to do so for this data set. To pick a specific base to use for the exact three prime end, we're turning to deep poly-A sequencing data available from several groups, including the poly-A DB project from Ben Tien's lab at Rutgers University, and a variety of public data sets that were processed for the poly-A site project from Christian Herman's lab at the Uni University of Basel. We've reanalyzed and integrated this data to define specific bases to use for the three prime ends, similar to what we've done for the CAGE data. With the deep sequencing data that we have now, we can define precise three prime ends for 72% of the transcripts. With a subset of 20% of genes where there's some evidence for, for one or the other or both groups needing to, to um, annotate a longer three prime UTR that needs more analysis and review that we're gonna work on over the next year. We're somewhat limited by the data sets we have available. We need to incorporate more data to close these gaps, but this is an excellent start. We're also able to use these techniques and data sets 
to find possible issues and omissions in one or both data sets. So here's an example for of ubiquitin peptidase, peptidase called USP11. In this case, both RefSeq and Ensemble have annotated using an upstream start site, which turns out to be very rare compared to the available transcripts data and the cage data. Going further, looking at conservation data and mass spectrometry, da spectrometry data and ribosomal profiling, we see there's strong evidence that translation, the protein, actually starts from this downstream AUG, and both data sets need to be reviewed to refine this DDS start site. We can also use these tools and data sets and other data sets to identify highly expressed or conserved transcripts that are found in some but not others. This example is for RGEF18, which encodes a member of a large family of guanine nucleotide exchange factors. Both RefSeq and Ensemble represent a shorter form expressed from a downstream promoter, and Ensemble also represents a separate upstream gene. The computational RefSeq dataset shown with XM accessions contains a set of models that spans this region. These models appear to represent valid, highly expressed transcripts that are similar to other family members, and they're good candidates to be added to both manually curated data sets with additional review. It's likely that one of these transcripts will ultimately be the choice that we use for select. I'll end this section with some considerations about sequence matching. So for this project, transcripts in the main data set must precisely match the sequence found in GRCH38. GRCH38 may represent minor alleles, but there are considerable benefits to matching sequence. It allows us to synonymize RefSeq and Ensemble identifiers, which would encourage bidirectional data exchange between different resources using different data sets. It also helps standardize variant interpretations across resources and remove some considerable confusion about exactly how to report this particular base in this particular context. I'll talk a bit more in the second part about some options for representing other alleles, but our, our, our priority here is to match almost all of these transcripts to the CRCH38 genome. So where are we at? And what are we, and how are we delivering the data? So we are producing versioned data sets with goals for limited updates uh, once transcripts are um, within one of these data sets, but uh, transcripts may eventually get updated in some cases. We are aiming for full coverage of the genome, but at this point, we're at about halfway. We have what, are, what we are labeling as the version 0.5 data set. This is based on cases where the two pipelines agree. We have CAGE and poly-A data to, to define precise five prime and three prime ends, and they pass a variety of QA metrics. Some of these may be subject to uh, updates over the next year as we look at um, mostly the extent of the three prime UTR and a few corner cases of review, but we expect the vast majority of these to be stable. We have up updated in RefSeq and coming in Ensemble release uh, 96. Um, we have matched 10,294 uh, transcripts, uh, one for 10,294 genes covering 53% of protein coding loci. So these RefSeq NM uh, transcripts and ensemble ENST identifiers um, are now synonymous. This data is available now by FTP with GFF3 and GTF uh, annotation files available, um, FASTA files for RNA and protein um, at this uh, website. And we've produced a track hub that uh, can be used to view these in browsers. The updated RefSeq records are already available in NCBI Entree and NCBI BLAST databases. They'll be in the NCBI um, uh, bi-monthly release in January. And we're working towards a public, full public release in spring 2019 when they will show up in Ensemble Release 96. And we're working on updates in NCBI's gene resource and genome browser to prominently display uh, these and help you connect to um, the main select transcript. To give you a sense of uh, how you can, can look at this data, uh, 
This is how a track hub uh, would appear at UCSC. This can be done now, and Janella will give you some more details on how this works. Um, here, in addition to the GrepSeq and GenCode basic annotations, um, I've loaded this additional track, which shows the pairs of Ensemble and RefSeq annotations, which are synonymous. Uh, at this point, we've color coded the two. Colors may change. And I'm showing two different genes here, so a single transcript for each one of these genes. I want to make special thanks to um, the many, many, many people that have produced publicly available data sets that, have, that we've been utilizing for this project. We have used a tremendous amount of transcript data from many, many, many people. I'm only highlighting a small number of those here, but I want to call out, uh, recognize the Human Protein Atlas RNA-Seq data set from Stockholm, the ENCODE RNA-Seq data set, the Entropolis uh, RNA-Seq analysis of 25,000 RNA-Seq runs um, um, from Johns Hopkins, a variety of long-read transcriptome data, including SLR-Seq and PacBio from Michael Snyder's lab, and many, many, many others. Don't feel left out if you produce these. We are grateful to you. If you have data that's not public, public uh, we would really appreciate having more data. Uh, special thanks to the Riken Institute and their Phantom 5 cage project, and poly A uh, sequencing data sets from Ventian's lab, analyses from Christian Herman's lab, and additional data from many other groups, and the Phyla CSF project from Manol Kellis' lab at MIT. And I really want to thank the large number of people from both teams that have been uh, working on this project and how well this has been, been going over um, the last few years at this point and moving forward um, over um, this continuing collaboration. I especially want to single out Alex Estashin and my team who's coded uh, uh, a lot of the the analyses that we've developed for the RESTIC Select analysis, Olga Kermaleva has coded our RESTIC Select pipeline. Dansi Kadali has helped with a lot of the deep dives into these, these data and also with the poly A and 3' UTR analyses. Craig Wallen has worked on our RESTIC Select public data flow. Catherine Farrell has been instrumental in understanding uh, how, the, how to interpret the cage data. Shashi Pujar, who's going to talk in the next session, uh, has been coordinating on the RESTIC side all of our, our curation efforts, uh, which means he has to look at all the really, really, really hard cases. Uh, and Jane Loveland has uh, done a similar coordination on the ensemble GenCode side, as well as Janela Morales um, and Jose Manuel Gonzalez has helped with some of the data flow on the ensemble side. And I really want to single out all of the curators on both the GenCode and LRG teams, and on the RefSeq team, who've already been instrumental in digging through, trying to understand how we should analyze this data. This is going to become uh, incredibly instrumental, especially over the next year, as we get into the harder and harder cases. Welcome back to the second session of this webinar. Um, I'm Shashikant Pujar, and um, I will be presenting a few examples in my uh, talk that hopefully will give um, a better insight into the main select methodology. As the previous speakers in this session uh, described, main select is a uh, component of uh, the main project where we aim to provide one well-conserved uh, and well-expressed and supported transcript for every gene, which also um, represents the biology at that gene. And um, in this project, we try to strike a balance between conservation and uh, expression in picking the main select transcript based on several other criteria that include prior curation, matches with the uniprot canonical isoform, transcript and protein length, and so on. So the the process of picking the main select transcript involved two main stages. In the first step, um, automated pipelines from NCBI and EBI pick their own representative transcript from the respective gene set. And in the second step, these two picks were compared for every gene. Now, obviously, there were two pools that we got as a result of this comparison. 
the first pool here is uh, cases where both the pipelines pick essentially the same transcript. And by same, I mean transcripts that resemble in uh, CDS and splice structure. There might be some differences in the start and end coordinates. So the next step was to assign specific transcript start and end positions um, based on some rules which were determined by CAGE and poly A criteria. Once the start and end positions were determined, both NCBI and EBI updated their transcripts in batch uh, to conform to these coordinates. And this is the set that is available today as main select version 0.5. The other pool is uh, it, it is included in the future plans for main select and uh, subsequent speakers in this session will describe that. So in the process of selecting the uh, representative transcript, in many cases the choice is pretty clear because some, uh, most or all of the selection criteria pretty much point to one transcript and both the pipelines end up selecting that transcript. However, in some cases, the choice is not that clear, and here are some reasons why. In some cases, uh, some or most criteria simply lack data, so the pipelines do not have much information to leverage their choice on. In other cases, um, some criteria may point towards one transcript, while others may point towards a different one, and in this case, the choice becomes a bit tricky. For example, one of the transcripts may be the best expressed in the gene, while the coding region of another transcript um, might be very well conserved compared to the uh, most expressed transcript. In some other cases, uh, especially in genes with a very large number of exons, it becomes challenging to come up with a very representative uh, combination of exons. And this leads to a situation sometimes where, say, the NCBI RefSeq set represents one uh, long, uh, huge transcript which is actually absent in the EBI set. And this uh, leads the two pipelines to, again, select different transcripts for main select. So with all these challenges, the ultimate aim is to pick one representative transcript which strikes the balance between conservation and expression. Another important point I wanted to make is manual review by uh, expert curators from uh, NCBI RefSeq group, as well as at EBI from the GenCode and LRG group have played a crucial role in this project, um, both in framing rules for the automated pipeline, as well as uh, in actually deciding the main select transcript for some difficult cases. So now I move on to the examples, which present both scenarios of automated selection, as well as cases where uh, it was manual review, which decided the main select transcript. So in this first example, um, this gene is, uh, has three main transcripts in contention. Uh, these are different splice forms which differ in this region here due to some exon skipping events happening. Now one of the transcripts, uh, which is in the top row here, scores uh, highest in multiple selection criteria like conservation, length of the protein, cage score as well as match to the Swiss broad canonical isoform. However, a different transcript is the most expressed one. So which one to choose as main select? Now, when we look at the data that reflects these contrasting scores, we see that the most expressed transcript actually skips two coding exons here, which leads to this long intron in that transcript. Now, if you look at the RNA-seq reads, which are shown here uh, in this track, which map across introns, we can see that the number of reads which support this long intron are at least twofold the number of reads which support these other introns, which are associated with the inclusion of either one or both of these exons. Now, this expression profile is also reflected in RNA-seq exon coverage graphs, which you see here. So in this uh, graph on a linear scale, you can see that both these coding exons show lower, visibly lower levels of expression compared to this constitutive exon, for example. Now that was about expression. Now if we look at conservation, it presents a different picture. Both these coding exons, which are skipped in the most expressed transcript, actually show pretty good conservation, indicated by the blue um, 
bars which indicate positive conservation. So this profile is pretty much on par with the conservation of these other exons. So in the final analysis, even though this uh, transcript is not the most expressed, uh, it was selected as the main select because of uh, high scores in multiple selection criteria, and in this case, conservation and um, <clears throat> match to Swiss Broad Canonical were deciding factors. Now this second example is a bit different in the sense that the two pipelines ended up choosing different transcripts here. Now the two transcripts in contention differ in this coding exon. And if we look at a magnified view of the region of difference, we can see that one of the transcripts has a longer coding exon because of uh, a splice side difference, which adds uh, nine extra codons to this transcript. Now both the transcripts uh, have similar scores for most criteria, including conservation, which is a bit surprising. You would expect the one with the longer exon perhaps to be more conserved. But if you look at Philo CSF um, profile in this region of difference, you can see that this extra coding region in the longer exon is not conserved at all. So the conservation is restricted to the common region of the two exons. In contrast, if you look at the expression profile, again, um, this is the track that shows the intron, um, I'm sorry, the RNA seq reads that map up across introns. You can see that the shorter exon is supported by uh, a larger number of RNA seq reads. And in fact, if you see data in two different uh, RNA seq data sets, the shorter, uh, shorter exon is supported by more than 20 fold the number of reads compared to the reads that support the longer exon. So in this case, even though the true transcripts um, show similar scores for uh, most criteria, conservation is uh, um, also similar, but expression is the deciding factor here, leading to the selection of this transcript as main select. Now here's the third example um, of a clinically associated uh, clinically significant gene. Um, this gene is associated with a rare uh, bone disorder called cherubism. In terms of uh, transcripts, this is a bit more complicated because um, the four transcripts that are in contention here arise from different promoter sites and have different transcription start sites. Now, again, if you look at the uh, first exons of these transcripts, you can see a visible expression difference um, based on this cartoon shows the RNA seq reads that support the first introns of these transcripts. And we can see that the upper two transcripts show comparable uh, expression scores of the first exons, whereas the lower two are pretty low in expression. Now here's a magnified view of the uh, five prime exons of the four transcripts. Now, if you look at the cage data from Phantom 5, here you can see that um, the four promoters again have different expression levels. Um, again, the upper two transcripts show pretty high levels of expression and the scores are equivalent in these two transcripts. Whereas the other two transcripts show, um, these promoters show very low levels of expression. And in fact, this fourth transcript did not even have any cage signal from Phantom 5. So again, when we look at the performance of all four transcripts in terms of different selection criteria, we see that this transcript scores pretty well and uh, has high scores in expression and in cage. Also, the protein matches the Swiss Broad canonical isoform. This lowermost transcript, which we saw in the earlier slide, is out of contention because it has low expression and no cage data. However, a different transcript shows the highest conservation. So let's look at the Philo CSF data to see what's going on with this transcript. Now, when we look at one set in Philo CSF, uh, before that, the transcript which has the highest conservation has a unique five prime coding exon. So it's likely that this is contributing to the higher conservation score of this transcript. Now, when we look at one of the data sets in Philo CSF, which is, uh, derived from 58 mammals, we do see some positive conservation at this exon. 
However, if we look at an expanded set of phyla CSF, which is derived from 100 vertebrates, there is no more conservation in this first axon. So the curators went in and looked at what's happening here. Uh, they looked at base by base alignment of um, several organisms in this region and found that several mammals had indels that disrupted the coding frame in this region. So the conservation signal that you see in a smaller set in Philo CSF is not quite true. And uh, therefore, um, in the end, it was decided to designate this transcript as main select based on greater expression and cage score. In addition, it had Swiss broad canonical match. Now, this is the last example that I have. And again, this is a clinically significant gene associated with uh, skeletal muscle disorders. Um, these are not all the transcripts. It's a subset of transcripts that, are, uh, that arise from this gene. And the important thing to uh, notice here is that there are two um, species of transcripts, two populations uh, arising from two distinct promoters. And this transcript here arising from the distal promoter has uh, the most conservation of the coding region, whereas a different transcript that arises from the proximal promoter is the most expressed. Another very interesting thing about this gene is um, there are several exons that are expressed exclusively in the skeletal muscle. And this gene is known to play a major role in the skeletal muscle. Now, when we looked closely at the um, RNA-seq exon coverage data um, in individual tissue samples, we can see here clearly that these uh, specific exons are sh um, show up only in the skeletal muscle tract, but not in the other tracts. <clears throat> Finally, multiple clinical variants have been reported in these skeletal muscle specific exons. For example, a clinical variant that is associated with nemaline myopathy is reported in this first uh, muscle, uh, skeletal muscle specific exon. So uh, in light of this, that is presence of clinical variants and um, this, uh, the function of this gene uh, being uh, in the skeletal muscle, the curators decided to designate this transcript as main select. So these are some examples which highlight the different uh, nuances of selecting the main select transcript, both based on automated pipelines as well as based on curation. So in summary, um, the choice of the main select transcript depends on multiple factors, such as conservation, expression, length of the transcript and protein, prior curation, which sometimes indicates clinical significance, as well as match to the cis broad canonical isoform. In many cases, the choice is not very clear. Several other transcripts come close to being chosen. However, we choose one which has the best combination of high scores in these criteria and best represents the biology at the gene. With the aim to strike the right balance between conservation and expression. Now, as I mentioned, the choice of the main select involves automation in most cases. In some difficult cases, manual review eventually decides the main select. The currently available uh, version of main select, which is version 0 0.5, uh, encompasses about 53% of what will be eventually the complete set. The future would be to complete this set and tackle the cases where we, uh, the first pass had different choices, and our next speaker will go into details um, of the, that other set. With that, I'd like to conclude this presentation. Thank you all for your patient hearing. I'd now like to hand it over to the next speaker, Jane Loveland. Thank you, Shashi. So my name is Jane Loveland, and I'm an annotation project leader here at Emberley BI. And I'm going to talk to you a little more about the progress that we've made in the main project and some of the future plans that we have as well. So, We've already been discussing main select. I'll just reiterate some of the progress that we've made so far on this. But there are a lot of challenges and limitations, so we need to discuss how we move on and also the next step for what we're going to do over the next year or so. 
What we want to do is get to around 90% of the human protein coding genes being covered with a select transcript. And then I'm going to introduce the concept of main plus and how we expand the number of transcripts per locus in a way that we can capture key aspects of gene structure. So we have our very latest first release, select version 0.5. And this is, as I've already said, 53% of the human protein coding gene count. So for these, let's reiterate, we have agreed a transcript, we have an agreed coding region, we have agreed five prime and three prime ends, and we have agreed 100% sequence identity. So we had a question earlier about what things are not agreed and what are the issues that we have. And actually what we found is that it's one or more of the things that we had agreed in the select set, we are not in agreement in the remaining 47%. So what are we going to do about this? So our goal for phase one was to get at least 50% of these and release this as a track, which we will discuss a little later in our analysis session. We have that now, which is great. So we know we have this single transcript. Another thing that we're trying to do is work with Uniprot to highlight the corresponding protein isoform as canonical because it's important that we have convergence with other databases too. But for half of these, the reason we have released 0.5 is we may fine tune the three prime ECRs and extend these in the future because this is fairly new data that we're looking at. And we want to reserve the right to be able to change these ECRs. So we have a tick to say that currently we have achieved our goal for phase one, which is great. But actually, this is quite a challenging thing to do. So as we know, biology is complex. There are often more than one well-supported, well-expressed, well-conserved transcripts at a locus. So making that decision can be quite challenging. The other problem is there are many gaps in the data. We don't have all the information that we need in order to determine particular transcriptional specificity. We have gaps in tissue coverage in humans. We will be expanding this data set, but for now we don't have full coverage. We also have gaps in our knowledge of this as well. So the knowledge of how transcripts function and therefore how to annotate these things is incomplete. And we are using proxies for this. So we tend to use conservation and expression as ways of quantifying this, but it's still an imperfect method, so we need to develop this more fully. The quantification of the level of transcript is actually really hard to do. Ideally, we'd like to have long read transcribic data for everything, but we don't have this right now, but we assume that this will be coming. And one of the ways that we validate these reads is by using intron data as a proxy for this, which isn't necessarily an ideal way of doing this. And then the final section on this challenge is that the ascertainment bias in current clinical variation data sets. So variant consequent calling is based on existing annotation and clinical relevance is based on our current knowledge. So we know there will be more of this available, but actually getting hold of this data and validating this data and adding it to our data sets is really important and it's something that we need to think about. And we also need to remember that the main select is not the only transcript that you will ever need. So limitations to what we've been doing. So for a select set, we're not going to capture any complexity. We are demanding a zero-sum choice, so either a presence or absence for this. So we often find when we're looking at these genes that transcripts have been excluded, which may score a very good, a very highly in the criteria that we're using to select for these transcripts, such as overall support for expression or conservation or line clinical variation. So it seems a shame that we can't capture this information. And also tissue specificity versus general pattern of expression. We may actually find that we have the most highly expressed transcripts, but it may not have other information associated with it, such as clinical importance. So a lot of this information is lost if we just have our single main select transcript. So the solution to this is what we're calling main plus. So this is how we get from our 53% to 90%. So we've done some very preliminary analysis and binned all of our different transcripts. So our first section is everything's identical, marvellous, you don't have to look at that again. The second bin is the same CDS, but maybe a different UTR length or a different splicing pattern in the UTR. And then our third bin are the more challenging genes for which we have a different CDS with or without a different UTR length or splicing pattern in the UTR. So in our initial data, we found that around 15% of our genes were in fact identical, which was marvelous. But then we had a whopping 85% of things which were not identical. So this is where the challenge began. Work in progress is very much on bin two at the moment. 
we are looking at the five prime and three prime ends of genes and trying to work on these. And as we know, we have done quite a significant amount of these because we've got to our 53%. So where do we go from here? So the way that our independent pipelines work, we do actually predict the same transcript for around 75% of genes. So this means we need to work on our UTR lengths and our splicing within the UTRs. And using the algorithms that we have started to develop, we're hoping that we'll be able to capture a lot of these fairly easily and be able to increase the gene count for the select set quite quickly. Predominantly, we're actually finding that the differences in these are in the 5' UTR. But then again, there's also a challenge with this. We found that for the 5' ends of genes, we don't actually have cage for around 17% of genes. So we need to find alternative ways of defining these ends. And for the three prime ends of genes, we have around 20% of these for which we have no poly A data. But obviously, we need to work on this too and define a way of getting good data to make decisions. So if we have a gene here in our bin three, our tricky bin, we have, for instance, a gene here where we have our coding sequence shown in green. We may have another gene which has exactly the same structure, but we have a different ATD choice. So we can look at conservation and have discussions between our curators and annotators to make this decision. We may also have UTR differences as well between these. So we're hoping that we can capture a lot of the UTR in an automated fashion. And then we have all of the above, where we have completely different splicing, different UTRs. We have presence and absence of exons as well. And this is where it becomes much more tricky. And what we're finding is that we actually need to manually review quite a few of these genes to understand the discrepancies between the two teams. And also we want to iterate this to improve our pipelines based on the review that we have for these genes. Obviously, this is the hardest bin. We would love to be able to automate this as much as possible. But for some cases, only looking at these things manually will help us actually decipher what the issue is. In many cases as well, we're finding that there's no definitive right answer. Either one could be selected. After all, this is biology. So what are we going to do? So we're going to move on to phase two. We want to review and update our remaining transcripts in the coming year. So this is for our remaining 47% of genes. As you already know, we're going to release the sets to be available in our browsers in spring 2019, which is our 0.5 set. But obviously, I've already pointed out, we have several challenges for this that we need to think about, where we have ambiguous data or absence of data, or we have different picks. So how are we going to reduce these 47% for which we don't have a select transcript right now? So we're going to improve these pipelines, iterate the process, and manually review. So let's move on to main plus and think about the challenges that that represents for us. So currently we have a small set of main selects, which would be one transcript for protein coding gene, and we want to overlap this. We see the main select as a subset of the main plus, which is a wider set of transcripts. So how do we define our main plus? We have a protein coding gene for which we have lots of different transcripts. We found that by using our pipeline, we can usually find a select transcript, which in this case is shown by this yellow one here. We may find that other transcripts are equally as valuable, and if that's the case, we can call these main plus. So this means we can tag them as saying this isn't what we will call our default transcripts, but we also think there's a lot of information to show that this is a very validated transcript. We have lots of information concerning it. So let's move on, finally, just to a couple of examples to try and work out what we do for main plus. So this is just a snapshot from our annotation tool, FedMap Otter of a gene called the DST gene. And as you can see, there's lots of different transcripts. The ones in green are protein coding and the ones in red are non-coding. And this is just some information which has come through from looking at the cage data. So as we look at all of these different transcripts, we see that from the cage data, we actually have five different promoters which have different expression profiles from different tissues. So this means that for the main select, we actually chose this longest one but it means that we are missing out on four other transcripts for which we have an awful lot of information. And actually, I haven't marked them here, but around here, there's a lot of clinical information and variants which are incredibly important. So we will capture a larger set of functionally important transcripts if we add these transcripts to the main plus. But we need to work on how we define this. Another example, again, that used for the vertical orientation, this is from our direct from our annotation tools, which is the HK1. And this is another difficult choice for where we go. 
So in the yellow box here, we have the most represented, the most highly transcribed in normal tissues. We have a very strong cage peak. And we can say that, right, we're going to choose this as our select transcript. But then again, we also have another transcript, which is actually found in red blood cells. And we have a huge amount of data associated with that. But then we have these other transcripts as well from different tissues and lots and lots of data for this. So this could be an example where we have another three very well supported transcripts in main plus, and this is not something which we find as an unusual basis. So what I would like to do is ask you guys what you think our main plus should be. So this is hopefully to stimulate some questions for later in the session. What should our criteria be? Is it how do we have this extension of main select? Should it be, should there be a threshold for inclusion? Do we include UTR differences? For example, alternative promoters are something which we can easily represent. Number of transcripts. Do you want minimal to cover all significant features such as exons and splice sites, bearing in mind that these numbers could increase with new data? We'd like to capture all transcript with significant features, but do we have to have strict limits on the number of these transcripts? How useful would this be to you, bearing in mind that the project that we're setting up is to try and minimize the transcripts that we look at for an initial basis? And stability. We're presuming that this data is going to be quite stable. Mm -hmm. How often should we update this set? Should we update it in response to new data? How regularly should we do these updates? These are all questions that we would like to put to you guys in our community because we can make some decisions on this, but we would like to make this set useful to you. So any of these questions, if you have any ideas, we'd be really, really pleased to hear from you. And I'm going to hand over to Terence, who is going to talk about some allele and update considerations with reference to the main project. Thank you, Jane. So I'm going to tell you a bit about um, uh, some of the issues that arise thinking about sequence and updates, uh, especially with the RefSeq side. The RefSeq data model allows for sequence differences between the transcript and the reference genome. And RefSeq is historically selected against rare alleles that are found in the genome, for example, at two or 4% uh, minor allele frequencies. We've defined this with several different criteria over the years, most recently saying that transcripts may differ from the genome if the genome has a minor allele frequency of under 5%. That is, RefSeq transcripts don't necessarily represent the most major allele, but we've generally selected against rare alleles. However, it hasn't been consistently applied across the whole data set. There may also be sequence differences between the GRCH37 and 38 versions of the assembly, which become an issue in some clinical contexts. But the main transcripts, whether it's in the select or plus set, must match the GRCH38 sequence. So what about those minor alleles? Well, there are huge advantages to matching to GRCH38. The GRCH38 assembly is what both RefSeq and Ensemble GenCode have primarily supported for the last five years. It's now adopted by more and more resources, including NOMAD. Our work with the main project also makes the GRCH38 assembly more attractive moving forward. The GRCH38 and 37 assemblies do represent a mix of haplotypes, although 70% of it is from a single donor uh, from which the RP11 cell line was generated. This donor is a, um, has been identified as an admixed African-European male, but the other 30% of the genome arises from over 70 individuals. That is, it represents uh, the beginnings of a pan-genome for humans. It does not represent the most common allele or haplotype at every position, or the ancestral allele or haplotype. But the overall sequence quality at every base is extremely high. That is, it is representing valid sequence that is found in the human population. Now, there's often been concern about, is the assembly going to change again? And at ASHG, the GRC uh, announced that they are indefinitely postponing a GRC H39, at least in this context, that would affect most users. While they're evaluating new models and sequence content, for the human reference assembly that are currently in development. There is work underway uh, for assembly improvements, but they are balancing the needs of clinical and research communities uh, that need stability versus assembly updates 
and we are coordinating with them uh, to minimize any future impacts. TRC H38 is going to be with us for a while, and the future is now, and it's the best resource to be using going forward. So how do current rest transcripts before this project compare to the TRC H38 sequence? So this is from an analysis that we ran about two years ago with a matched data set of all rest transcripts aligned to both GRC H37 and 38, looking at uh, overall sequence alignments. What we can see is um, just counting absolute transcripts, there, at that time there were about 3,500 rest transcripts that had one or more mismatches versus 38. About, um, about a 40% drop compared to how they align to 37. Most of those mismatches are in UTR, about 1,000 rest transcripts have mismatches in the CDS. These are mostly mismatches. There's a smaller number of indels. Again, 38 uh, is, the rest transcripts are a better match to 38 than 37. And most of these indels are in UTRs, not CDS. There's a very small number of frame shifting indels. Uh, and again, you can see here, that 38 is a much better representation uh, than 37 for, um, for these several hundred genes. Um, and uh, virtually all genes are completely represented within 38. Again, a significant improvement compared to the 37 assembly. The 38 is already much better. If we look at this in the context of individual SNPs, this breaks down to about 1,900 individual sites. About half of these are in UTRs, and another 20% are synonymous changes in the CDS, and the rest predominantly are, um, are missense uh, SNPs within CDS. Only, there's only a very few uh, number of these SNPs that have never been observed in any of the population studies that are currently available in dbSNP, whereas about half of these do correspond to to minor alleles at a frequency of below 5%. There are very few um, of these SNPs that have obvious deleterious effects on coding region. These 13 uh, primarily correspond to, to genes that are polymorphic pseudogenes, where there are functional and non-functional alleles segregating in the population at significant frequencies. In the GRCH38 primary chromosome sequence represents a non-functional allele um, or a pseudogenized allele, and uh, often a second allele is represented um, with a, a second sequence within GRCH38 in the alt and, and patch scaffold collection, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Looking at data available in ClinVar, the sequences that are in GRCH38 are very, very, very rarely considered to be pathogenic. There are only seven individual SNPs in GRCH38 that are flagged as pathogenic in ClinVar, and small numbers of, of SNPs that are associated with other factors. So the GRCH38 sequence is by and large very high quality and representing functional uh, transcripts. So what about variant reporting when the genome is a minor allele? Uh, for example, in this case. So we have a number of options that we're very interested in your feedback on. First and foremost, and as I said in the first part, um, our preferred data model in these cases, almost every case, is to match to the GRCH38 chromosome sequence, even for rare alleles. In the first round of updates, we did avoid SNP changes for cases of more significant community interest, including those that are in public LRGs. Uh, and we will be um, looking at those and discussing further in the future. Uh, but most of these, all of those 53% have been matched to GRCH38. We do have, have explored the option with GRC um, to either use existing uh, alt or patch scaffolds that are available within the GRCH38 uh, assembly. And in some cases, we may be able to add additional patch scaffolds. To explain that a little further, if you're not familiar, 
the GRC assembly model includes not just uh, a, a single primary assembly with the chromosomes, but contains sequences, um, additional scaffold sequences that represent different haplotypes for the same genomic region. What I'm showing here is alignments for a set of uh, alt low size scaffolds for the HLA region, which has considerable amounts of sequence diversity in different human populations. What these images show is the red ticks are, are mismatches, there are indels, larger gaps, um, and some insertions that you see um, throughout this sequence with considerable diversity between each of these sequences. So these are, are all sequences that are available in the GRCH38 assembly uh, representing different individuals. And in the case of HLA, we actually have two RefSeqs, one representing exactly the sequence found on the, uh, the primary chromosome and a second RefSeq based on um, the clinical community preference that matches the sequence uh, found in one of these alternate um, haplotypes. So we can work with GRC um, and potentially use this to a limited degree to represent alter alternative sequences, especially in cases where um, there are egregious sequence errors in the primary assembly um, that just don't represent a functional product. This third option, it is possible and valid in, in at least some resources to continue to use old RefSeq versions for reporting. ClinVar will continue to accept these um, with, with existing inf infrastructure at NCBI, and um, you know, this, this can work elsewhere, but it is by and large uh, preferred to be able to move to the latest versions of sequences um, which are going to be best, best supported across uh, resources throughout the world. We can look at making allele-specific RefSeqs. As I mentioned, we've done this already in the case of HLAA. Um, and we do have a question uh, posed to the, the community of whether we would make this temporarily, um, as, so temporarily have two RefSeqs, one matching the GRCH38 chromosome for the main collection and the second one representing a different sequence um, so that we can, um, can at least support that internally um, and also be able to support that within LRG, um, but may not need to retain the sequence in the permanent data set. Um, and in cases where there is a, uh, a, a patch scaffold, in some cases we actually have two different RefSeqs. For example, those polymorphic pseudogenes, uh, we may have two RefSeqs ref representing the functional and non-functional alleles. And finally, uh, and you'll hear more about this in the next session from, uh, from Jonella, um, LRG is a project that can be used to, uh, to represent um, non-GRCH38 alleles and help address this. So what about GRCH37? GRCH37 is, um, we would like to say, is old into the tooth, but we know it's very actively used within, uh, within many communities. It is um, coming up on, on um, being out of date by five years. Um, I have to emphasize that the main transcripts are all matching to GRCH38 and, and May and, and of the phase one set, about 4% of them have sequence differences versus GRCH37. Um, we, in the past, have done some limited annotation updates for GRCH37 that are available from RefSeq. Um, and to some extent, we'll, we'll do this to at least some degree. Um, but we are really encouraging groups to move forward to GRCH38 to be able to take advantage of the latest annotation resources, including MAME, um, and really take advantage of, of having sequence consistency um, across, across all of these data sets. So what about updates? Um, as I said, many, uh, almost all of the, the transcripts in the this version 0.5 MAME collection 
um, have gone through updates. The vast majority of those are just updates to uh, the extents of five prime and three prime UCRs. Uh, but in some cases, we are doing updates um, that are affecting CDS, either because of indels or because of, of uh, reconsidering um, the, the proper AUG choice because of new understandings of the data. So in this diagram I'm outlining, we may have an original RefSeq with ends like this, with several mismatches, with an indel. Um, and when, if we do an update like this, and update ends and, and or update um, mismatches. These are always represented, any, any change in the sequence of the RESTIC transcript results in a version change. The succession remains the same, but the version changes. It is also true if, um, with, with current practice, if we alter, um, for example, we change an indel or we alter the AUG choice, uh, without really affecting the splice site, um, we typically retain the same accession, but we, we update the version within, um, within the RefSeq. Um, and we're interested in feedback from the community about, um, about what is most desirable for, um, for you. Um, I'll emphasize that when we do this type of change, this can, especially if we change the AUG choice, uh, this does influence HGBS CDOC coordinates uh, between two different RefSeqs because the AEG is different or it positions downstream of an indel have changed. <laughs> Typically, in, in recent practice, if we change the splice pattern either in CDS or UCR, we will issue a new accession for RefSeq. So, with that, um, I'm wrapping up and I will pass on to our, our last speaker. Joanna Morales to talk about the future plans for the LRG project. Thank you, Terrence. I will now spend the last um, session here of our webinar first talking about the LRG project, and then I will um, go into a little bit more detail about how you can, you can access the main data that we have made available. So how does the main project relate to the Locus Reference Genomic or LRG project. I think many of you are probably familiar with the LRG project. It is a joint effort between the NCBI and the EMBL-EBI since 2008. And this project really started from requests from the clinical community uh, to standardize variant reporting. And some of the reasons they, they came to us with this request was based on some challenges that the community was experiencing. The first one was basically keeping track of clinically relevant variants over time. And this was primarily due to changes to ongoing changes to the reference. So 36 to 37 to 38, how do we keep track of a variant as, as um, over time as these references change? Also, uh, there, there was a noted inconsistency in the way variants were being reported, and this was uh, due to the availability of numerous reference sequences. So um, I've already mentioned changes to the reference, but also there were changes to transcripts, and that was also based on as new biological data was uncovered, new transcripts were created, or existing transcripts were updated, and that was also causing inconsistency. So for example, this is a gene, Fiona already mentioned it earlier today, it's a gene for TSC2. There are 14 different NMs, there are 69 different ENSCs, and we know from members of the community that they prefer to have one. So which one of these transcripts do you pick? Which one to use for the clinical use case? And so, so the LRG project set itself to standardize variant reporting at clinically relevant loci by defining suitable transcript and genomic reference sequences. And we have identified two primary cases over the years, the first one really members of the community coming to us to find out which transcript or small set of transcripts should be used for variant reporting. And in that case, they were asking what, what NM should they be using or which ENST. Um, and and that, that, that has been the primary use case. But also, we've had a particular use case of groups that come to us so that we can define preferred genomic sequence when GRC are 
GRCH38 is not optimal. Now, Terence has talked quite a bit about that, but we know that there are members of the community that prefer to use a particular sequence that is not GRCH38 when reporting their variants. And that could be either because 38 has known issues, for example, in the case of ABO, but it could also be a desire to report using a, a more common haplotype. And we know this, for example, the star allele systems that uh, CYP gene family uses or the blood group genes, they prefer to, to report everything on the most common allele or haplotype. But also we have the use case of simply historical usage for more than 50 years or, or for as long as there have been publications on a particular gene, a particular reference sequence has been used and the community prefers very much to report using that. So they've come to us to, to provide them a genomic sequence that, that would be optimal. Now, in the case of LRG records that are, are compatible, fully compatible with GRCH38, the goal there has been to select and also as much as possible to match transcripts. And I'll give you one example here. This is a recently made LRG for JAG1, and you can see that we have selected a transcript, which we call T1, but you can also see the NM and ENST identifiers. But in addition, we've been able to make that transcript identical between the NM and the ENST. As you can see here, this particular tr selected transcript is identical to both of these um, accessioned transcripts. So this effort is very similar to and completely compatible with the main select that we've been talking about this afternoon. Now for records that we, we make that are independent of GRCH38, the primary task there is to define the alternate genomic sequence, which is the most suitable one. And then we can go through the process of selecting the transcript now, in the case of records that are independent of 38, the only transcript included in the records are RefSeq transcripts because the ENSTs, as has been explained today, are uh, dependent and must match GRCH38. And then finally, for these LRG records, we take good care to annotate the record so it is very, very clear when these transcripts and this genomic sequence is different from 38. Here I'm giving you one example. This is the LRG for HTT, the gene in Huntington's disease. And here you can see that we've selected one transcript, but we're making a point to say that the genomic sequence included here has differences with respect to the primary assembly. We then are also clarifying how these, this particular transcript differs from the reference and from the known ensemble transcripts. And then we add an additional annotation explaining why we've gone ahead and created a record that is independent of 38. And in this case, you will see that for historical reasons, the preferred sequence was one that carried a particular number of CAG repeats. Now, what I'd like to now focus on is how, how does the LRG and MAIN relate to each other? I'd like to point out that the LRG project, we very much view it as a precursor of the MAIN project. Um, there are similar goals to the main project, but a distinct focus and approach. So the LRG, as I've explained, has a very clinical focus. It is not a genome-wide project. It's, it's done based on requests by the clinical community, and it is focused on clinically relevant genes. Also, the LRG project is 100% manually curated. There is no automation involved. So of course, this means that it, is, it goes into great detail in the amount of data or how it reviews data, but it's also a bit slower than, than the main project. And I'd like to point out that the LRG project is also by community consensus. That means that for any LRG we create, we go ahead and identify and work with local specific ex experts so that we can make sure we include the most suitable reference sequences in our records. And finally, the, main pro the LRG is also a precursor of the main plus in particular because we do include in an LRG all transcripts that are required for reporting. So we don't just include one, we can include all transcripts that we feel that the community together with us deem are necessary for variant reporting. And that is compatible with what has been described here as the main plus project. Now, one thing we want to say is that we've spent a big, big portion of 2018 thinking about how we will integrate the LRG project with a main project. Our goal here has been 
integration rather than having two parallel systems for, for the community. We think that that is confusing and so we've worked really hard to integrate the two. And how exactly have we done that? Well, for one, the LRG team has been fully involved in the development of Maine. That, it, that means scientific, scientific contribution as well as manual curation involvement in, in this development. We've also changed our processes to be main compatible. That means that all LRG curation takes into account the main transcripts and main takes into account LRG curation. Also, since May of 2018, for all GRC H38 based records that we've created, all the LRG transcripts are now 100% match between the NCBI transcript and the EBI transcript, very similar to what we do with the main project. And in future, we will make sure in LRG records that we will flag the main select transcript. And also, we've spent quite a bit of time communicating with our current users about the main project. Again, this is because we want integration and, and not creating an, an alternate system uh, that will create confusion. Now, I will touch now on what we expect for the LRG project moving forward. So for GRCH38 um, genes, the genes that are compatible with, with the current uh, sequence in the reference, we will continue to make LRG records until we can fully deliver the select and the plus. For um, LRG records or for genes that where the GRCH38 sequence is not the most suitable, we will create LRG records so that we can serve this particular community. Again, we will work with a community to define the most suitable alternate sequences. We will work with GRC to create patches wherever possible. But one important component is that we will also serve as manual curation support for the main project. As I said, we've been contributing in this way and we will continue to do so in the future. Now, for, for the LRG project, this is a project that has some longevity. And as we think about integrating with the main project, we, we welcome your feedback as to the best way to do that and, and also your thoughts on the non-reference based records and, and how we can best serve that community. Now, I would like to switch gears a little bit to talk about main data access and display. My colleagues have already talked quite a bit about this, but just to, to reiterate, we have now, um, we have now released uh, 53 main select transcripts for 53% protein coding genes. And to access this data, uh, the NCBI has created a, a uh, path here where you, can, where you can find the data and also a, tra a track hub that you can use to view the data in your favorite web, uh, web browser. Also, as has been pointed out, the current version you will find is version 0 0.5. Now, if you follow that link to, uh, to the public path, you will see a number of files here. For those of you who um, don't typically use this, you can, you can see a, num a number of files, but I would like to point a few features. You can find genomic annotation on GTF or GFF files. You can find the FASTA files for RNA and protein sequences. You can find GenBank flat files for RefSeq. And importantly, you can find a summary file, which is just a, a spreadsheet that has a list of all the, the uh, main select transcripts, their genes, gene symbols, and, and the corresponding identifiers. And also the track hub, where you can again upload that onto your favorite browser and you can view the data. Going back to the summary file, I would just like to show you what it looks like. You can find the gene symbol, you can find the RefSeq and the ensemble identifier, and all of these and in version 0.5 will have the main select um, listed here. We envision in the future you will be able to see which ones are main select and which ones are part of the main plus set. If you look at the track hub and ensemble, this is what you will see. You will see all the RefSeq transcripts. You can see your ensemble transcripts, but also here is what your track hub will look like. And there you will see an ENST identifier as well as the NM, corresponding NM identifier. Similarly, with the NCBI's genome data viewer, again, 
these the RefSeq transcripts. Here are the ensemble transcripts, and you can see the select here at the bottom. Similar color coding for all browsers, um, and and you can find your ENSC identifier and the corresponding NM. And finally, for your UCSC, again your RefSeq, your ensemble, and here is the select version 0, 0 0.5. Now, this is a, a glimpse at what might be in the future for Ensemble. And in the gene page, this is for the spring of 2019, we envision having a flag in this column that I have highlighted here for flag, where you might see the attribute main select for the select transcript, and you wouldn't see it for the other, other transcripts in the gene table. And then you would see additional annotation um, in the summary section. And I know the NCBI is now thinking through how they will do a similar display on their gene pages. And finally, a summary of what we have discussed today very quickly. I hope these are the take home messages. NCBI and EBI are working jointly to produce a subset of matched transcripts. We are calling the main select that set of transcripts where you have one transcript per locus that we intend to use as a default across resources. Currently, there's that there's 53% of the genome in, in the main select set, and we aim to have at least 90%, hopefully by 2019. You can find it here and on as a track hub. Now, the very important caveat that Fiona and Jane have already mentioned is that, of course, this is not the only transcript you will ever need. It is, it is one as a default across resources. Of course, you need to review all transcripts, especially when you're doing clinical interpretation. We have the main plus set, which is basically additional well-supported transcripts, as Jane described, and we hope to have that by 2019, 2020. And finally, all transcripts in the main set will match GRCH38. In those cases where GRCH38 is not the optimal sequence, Karen's described some options, and I have described the LRD as a viable option to represent that. And with that, the last thing I have to say is to show you and thank all the people who have been involved on this project. You can see all the logos for all the groups involved. You can see the funding agencies. You can see all the people that have been involved. It has been a very fruitful collaboration. And we look forward to working with you. I have here provided two addresses where you can contact us. There's a main help one for main related questions, and then there's a contact at LRG for LRG related questions. But please note that you can use either one because it is the same group of people that are working on both projects. So either address that you use will get to us and we will get back to you. And now we have the final speaker of this afternoon, uh, Fiona Cunningham, and she will deliver um, some closing remarks. Um, well, I, I don't have a, an awful lot to say. I just hope that you have found um, these talks interesting and informative. Um, we're very grateful for your participation, especially for your questions. They are always, they help us to think about the wider context of the work that we're doing. Um, please test the data and do get in touch if you have further questions or if you see any blockers that would impact on your ability to, to use our, our data and our transcripts. But with that, then, um, I think we will conclude here. Thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch when we have more to share. Thank you, everybody.